Now we need to talk about how things are spread out. Okay? Now, imagine that you had these two data sets. sets are very similar. The only difference is the lowest number in each list. And the first data set has the lowest number of 30 and the second one has the lowest number of 7. But everything else is the same. I even went ahead and put it in order for you, although the order really doesn't matter on this one as much. It's still helpful, but it's not necessary because you can still pull out the information without putting it in order. First thing I want you to notice is that the range of this data set, data set number one, okay? This is an easy calculation. This also should be on your formula sheet. Um, this is the highest value minus the lowest value. So the highest, if these were test grades, we'd be looking at a 95 minus 30 or an answer of 65. The range for the second data set, same thing, highest minus lowest, the range would be a 25. Now, if these were test grades and you were the teacher, which test grades would you like better? Data set one or data set two, if you were the teacher? Why would you like two as opposed to one? The numbers are higher in general. Everything's the same except which one? Yeah, that first one, that lowest number. Now, if you were to have this as a list of test grades, you would say, well, from the highest to the lowest, I had a range of 65 points. That's pretty significant. That's pretty big. On this one, I only had a range of 25 points. If these were my individual test grades for work I've done, then I only had a difference of maybe 25 points from the high grade to the low grade. You know, this is going to indicate better strength of students, where this is going to say, oh, there was a bad day, or there was one student who had a hard time with that material. Everybody else was more consistent. Now, does that tell you a whole lot about each individual number? No. Because no one 65 and no one 25, the only difference was this very first number. Everything else was the same. But there is such a difference in the range, but there's not a lot of information given to you there. So there's got to be another measure of spread. Okay, range is one of them. The second one is called standard deviation. <coughs> Now, standard deviation measures spread as well, but it's going to use every data value in your data set, not just the highest and lowest. So the first thing we want to do is to write down all our X values. And what I mean by X values are all your data values. What we'll do is data set number one. Okay? So I'm going to copy those in a list. And in the second column, it says to calculate x minus x bar. Anybody remember what x bar represents? The mean, I heard it, the average. So can you average this list of numbers? Okay, go ahead and average data set number one. Okay. The average. 
average is 75. Now, how do you read this chart? Because again, this is here to help you do this. I don't want you to memorize this and do it on your own. You're supposed to take each value and subtract the average. So 30 minus 75. And some of these will be negative and you want that to happen. Negative 45. And then 70 minus 75. And you would go through the whole list. So go through and subtract 75 from each item and write it on that corresponding row. So this one should be 0, 75 minus 75, 80 minus 75, 85 minus 75, and then 15 and 20. Now, here's a little quick check because you don't want to get too far in this table and realize you've messed up and you wrote one number down wrong. If you'll add up all the positive numbers, I'm looking at 15 and 15 is 30 and 20 is 50. And then you add up the negative numbers, you get negative 50. They should cancel each other out. The only time you might not get it exactly down to zero is if you have a decimal on some of these and you had to round. But you know you're on the right track if these all add up to zero. Okay, you're ready to go. Okay. Now let's say you have x minus x bar squared and you've got this last column to complete. This says take the answer you had right here and square it or multiply it by itself. Now every time you do that, every answer is either going to be zero or positive. Okay? Zero or positive. So you can either type in negative 45 times negative 45 or you can type in inside parentheses negative 45 and square it or the easiest thing is just to say 45 squared because you know it's going to be positive anyway. So what's 45 squared? Two thousand twenty-five. Okay. Everybody double check us. Two thousand twenty-five. Okay. And then over here, instead of typing negative five times negative five, just do five squared. It's going to be positive. Negative times negative is positive. So that's a 25. All right, this one's just zero. So I said it will either be zero or positive. 25. This would be 100. 15 squared. 225, good. And then 20 squared. 400. Okay. This is a column that I eventually want to add up once I have all my positive or zero answers. What does this add up to? 2,800. Okay, double check us. So I'm going to let you guys do it. So let's do this add up you want a second. Hold on. Everybody getting 2800? Okay, good. All right, just double check because, again, if you type one number wrong, it's going to mess everything up. So really watch what you're doing. Now, what you've done off your formula sheet is the table part. If you notice, there's another formula listed above it. This is how you finish the problem. So a lot of these, you've got to start them and then finish them. So percentiles, range, now standard deviation. The symbol is an S. It's usually a lowercase s. If you were taking a statistics class, you would use s to represent standard deviation, and you would specifically say it's for a sample, which means a small group. Not everybody that could be measured, but the small group that you're choosing to measure. If you notice the formula said s equals, and then it has a square root. It has an uh, interesting formula there that has a sum on it. Well, that is this number right here. You've done that hard work. So you don't have to do anything to it except put 2800 on top. 
and then divide it. Now you have to look at the rest of the formula, which says what? N minus 1. Now I said you guys need N. What's N again? 7. So you'll do 7 minus 1. 7 data items. Okay, N is 7. How many items you have? Now, this is a lot like BSA. Make sure you know how to do square root of a fraction. Personally, I would say 2,800 divided by 6. Go ahead and get that number. Leave it in your calculator display. And then take the square root of your answer. So there's no need to write down anything in the middle. And when you take the square root of your answer from your calculator, you will probably see something close to 21.6. A lot of times, I'll ask you to round maybe three decimal places, so you may see this go out to 602. It just kind of depends on the instructions. Okay? But standard deviation would do this. Now, what does this mean again? It measures spread. The bigger the number, the more spread out the data items are compared to the average. Notice how they were all compared to 75. And then we use those numbers to square and add and put in our formula. Everything was compared to 75. The bigger this gets, the more spread out the numbers are from the average. What I'd like you to try on your own is data set 2. Put everything back in here. Get your average, subtract them all, square those answers, pop it in the formula, and see if you get a different answer. Now, visually, which data set is more spread out? Number one or number two? Number one's more spread out. It has a bigger range, and it will have a bigger standard deviation. This one will have a smaller range and a smaller standard deviation. Standard deviation is going to be a little bit better because it uses every data item and doesn't just use the highest and the lowest. Okay? So I want you to practice with your spread, range, and standard deviation. And again, just use the chart. Do not worry about memorizing this formula. You will have it on your formula sheet, but you've got to know how to use it. Okay? And don't just stop here by adding up this column. Put this number in the numerator and then finish out your problem with the square root. Okay? All right, let's start working on the normal distribution. This is in lesson four. Uh, this is going to be based on having a mean and a standard deviation. We talked about standard deviation in lesson three and we showed how to calculate standard deviation. Now I'm just going to give you the value and show you how to use it. Okay? So the first thing I want you to realize is. You know, what's the basic shape of a normal distribution data set, okay? We've drawn a lot of distribution graphs as far as histograms, frequency polygons, and those are good for small sample sizes, but when you start talking about a large number of people or possibly the population, the big group that you're interested in, you're going to draw a different shape and you're going to kind of generalize the shape some. And so we're going to just do a basic idea of what we're talking about. And again, this is just a quick introduction. Okay, we're not getting real deep into this as if you were in statistics and really studied it. But we're going to talk a quick introduction of what the normal distribution is. Now as far as the shape, it is a bell-shaped curve. It looks symmetric. It has a, basically a high point in the middle. And it has sloping sides off to the ends on the right and the left. It'll take a little time to get used to drawing this. But this is the basic idea of what a normal distribution would look like. The normal distribution is going to be centered around the mean. And it's going to be spread out based on the standard deviation. Okay? Now the standard deviation tells you how wide the data is compared to the mean or how narrow the data is compared to the mean. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark off to the end. Notice I, I drew the curve so it goes slowly to the axis here. I'm going to draw three standard deviations, like three little tick marks on the right and three on the left. In general, you will cover a majority of this curve if you put three standard deviations on the right and three standard deviations on the left. Now what do I mean by you're going to cover all of this? Let me go ahead and write this down. I'm 
try to make them stand out. And I tried to spread my tick marks out evenly. Okay, if this was units of five, this would be adding five, add five more, add five more. What do you think you do on the left hand side? <laughs> subtract five, subtract five, subtract five. So I'm looking at this as an axis and I'm trying to label some numbers. Well, the five or whatever number I add or subtract is how much a standard deviation is. So a standard deviation is from one tick mark to the next, that is how much your standard deviation is. Okay, now I'm going to mark off, like I said, three above and three below. When we have actual numbers, we'll put those depending on our example. What I mean by covering most of the data set is that if you look at three standard deviations below the mean, so this mark right here, and three standard deviations above the mean, you're going to have almost 100% of the data. Now we're going to phrase it in terms of probability. We're going to say we have almost 100% chance of being between this low number and this high number. <clears throat> now what does that mean, being between them? If I was to shade my curve and shade everything from the low number up to the high number, does it look like I've shaded most of the curve? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This represents 99.7% of the data or 99.7% probability of being between the low number, whatever this number is, and the high number. Now that leaves a little room for some tail ends. We have a tiny amount of open space here and a tiny amount of open space here. Anybody have a guess how much is left from this end and this end? How much covers the entire curve? What percent? A hundred percent. What if you did a hundred minus ninety-nine point seven? Point three. You get point three. Okay. Now that means I have zero point three percent that has not been shaded or accounted for just yet. This is a symmetric curve. What does that mean? What do you think that means, symmetric? It's equal in both ends. You distribute it equally or evenly. So if I distribute this evenly into two ends, I can divide this by two. You end up with 0.15%. Now, this little tail end right here is 0.15%. This little tail end here is 0.15%. Okay. One of your goals for this section is to try to identify how much you have in certain little sections. So right now we know one thing out of the empirical rule which is going to be a set of three numbers to help you with these standard deviations. One number is 99.7 and that starts with three below and three above for standard deviations around your mean. But you can figure out your tail end sections by subtracting it from the hundred because that's the total amount, and cut it in half because it's symmetric, okay? Now, what if I change my picture to look like this? And again, every time I'm going to put my mean in the middle, and I'm going to mark off three standard deviations above, I'm going to try to spread them out evenly, and then three below. And this time, instead of doing three to the left and three to the right, why don't I just do two? If I do two standard deviations, this one is two standard deviations below, this one is two standard deviations above. If I want to look at what's between those two numbers and shade this amount, is that more or less than the purple? Definitely less, okay? Now, 
This number, when you do two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below, it represents 95%. Okay? And you could subtract that from 100, or you could subtract it from the previous number. Because, what do you know already? This little tail end section is how much? Yeah, 0.15%, 15 hundredths of a percent. Very small amount. That'll be true for all of them. It's going to be true for all of them, yes. 0.15% here. Okay? The only thing I don't know are these two sections. Well, what I can do is pretty similar. I can say 99.7 minus 95. What do you get here? What's the difference? 4.7. All right, and then cut it in half. What do you get? Two point three five percent. Well, that tells you how much you have here and how much you have here. Okay. Well, if I've done three standard deviations away, now two standard deviations away, let's do one standard deviation away. Again, draw your normal distribution curve, put your mean in the middle, and mark off three standard deviations on the left, three standard deviations on the right, and now let's focus just moving one away from the mean, one standard deviation away from the mean. If I shade what's in between there, I'm going to get this picture. Do I have more or less? than either of these two. Yes. Got even less. I keep getting closer and closer, which as I shade it keeps giving me a smaller and smaller portion of the graph. This is actually going to be 68%. Okay? What we have just determined, and I've given you these numbers, these are stated in your empirical rule. You have 68%, 95%, and 99.7% are your common values no matter what your mean is or what your standard deviation is. It doesn't matter as long as you know that it's normally distributed, and I'll tell you that, and then you have to know the mean and you have to know the standard deviation. But if you move one standard deviation away from the mean, above and below, you are going to expect 68% of the data, or a probability of 68% of being between them. If you go two standard deviations away, you will expect 95%. If you go three standard deviations away, you will do 99.7%. And the nice thing about these problems, <coughs> even though you may not be used to normal distribution, is that these percents you work for every example. You will use them over and over and over again. Now, something else we were doing. We were locating these tail ends and telling people how much they are. Well, what if I do the same thing here? Yep. Here are the ones I already know. But to get these two sections, I can subtract 68 from 95. What do you get there? 27. And then it's symmetric, so cut it in half. So 
13.5% is right here, and 13.5% is right here. Now, these numbers are going to occur over and over and over again. You do not have to get different numbers every time. The only thing that changes are the numbers on the bottom. And I have to tell you what your mean is and what your standard deviation is so you can use it. If they're going to occur the same over and over again, if I can just learn how to use the numbers in the rule together, I can tell you what each little section is. I can answer any question in the world. Um, one other thing that I want to mention. If I was to take this section and cut it in half, I shaded it in blue, what would each side be? 34%. Okay, so this one's 34%. This one's 34%. Add up the following numbers. 34. 13.5, 2.35, and 0.15. You get 50. Now, 50%. Have we talked about a number that deals with 50%? Yes, we have. The which one? The median. What percentile is the median? 50th percentile. Now, notice what you have been finding. These are percents. You can think of them as percentiles. This is the 0.15% percentile. Okay, not even 1%. This is the 2.5% percent percentile. <coughs> this one would be, what's 2.5 plus 13.5? 16.5. 16 That's your 16th percentile. And then this one jumps to the 50th. And then this is your 84th percentile. And then this would be whatever 84 plus 13.5 is. 97.5? Um, yeah. Okay. Then add 2.35, 99.85, and then you're at 100%. So these percents go right along with the positions of percentile, but notice you only have specific positions. Now, if you were in a statistics class, you would learn how to do the 30th percentile. We don't have to do that in this class. We're just getting good introduction, normal distribution, because you know you can do any percentile you want. Okay, But we're only going to stick to the ones that give us standard deviation values centered around that mean. Okay, So it helps you remember standard deviation is centered around your mean. Okay, So, what could you do for any problem? Start off every picture by drawing your normal distribution curve. Label your mean in the middle, and again, put three tick marks above, three tick marks below. Once you put in your tick marks, go ahead and draw your little sections to the top of your curve. And then label each little section with the percent that you figured out. They're always going to be the same. Okay? We said 34% was in the middle on both sides. What came next was 13.5%. And then what came next was 2.35%. And then the little tail end sections were the 
That is consistent on every empirical rule problem. Never changes. The only thing that's going to change are the numbers that I put down here, and I will have to tell you the mean and the standard deviation. Now, what if I tell you your mean is, for example, 10, <coughs> and your standard deviation, I'm going to abbreviate, let's say it's 5. You're going to put 10 in the middle, and then you're going to add 5 above it each time, and you're going to subtract 5 below it each time. So what would this number be? 15, add 5. 20, add 5 again. 25. Now over here, you subtract 5. 5, 0, and negative 5. Now don't be bothered by the fact that it's negative. That's just how the numbers worked out. Who knows what this example represents? You know, it's just the mean and the standard deviation. That's the only thing you have to really add to your problem. Now I can start asking questions. For example, I could say, what is the probability? Of being between? Zero and twenty-five. What is the probability of being between zero and twenty-five? Now, all that means is here's zero, here's twenty-five. I want to be between those two numbers. So I want anything from here up to here. I'm covering this little section, thirteen point five. I'm covering this section, 34, this section, 34, this section, 13.5, and this section, 2.35. 97.35, okay? And that's it. You're done. So do you see how you use this? Anything between those two numbers, you just list all the sections in between them and you'll add up the probabilities, you'll combine them as a total. But between it, we'll take it from here all the way up to there. Questions? Okay, what if I asked you this? What is the probability of being less than 20? What is the probability of being less than 20? So here's 20. Less would mean below it. Got to go all the way to the end. We use this section? No, this one's going to be back open again. That's above 20. 97.5. 97.5. And you can add them up individually. 0 0.15, 2.35, 13.5, 34, 34, and 13.35. Does anybody see a quicker way? <coughs> Okay, you can subtract what we're not using. This little section, this is what, 2.5 total? What could you subtract it from? Subtract it from 100 because the entire curve is going to represent 100% of your data. So what the normal distribution is trying to do is just give you a way to 
show how much data is in each section. Okay? If we say less than 20, then we have almost all the data, 97.5%. If we say from 0 to 25, we have almost the same answer, 97.35%. Doesn't matter if the answer is the same or very similar, it just matters what's in each section. <coughs> so what if I asked you, what is the probability of being between <coughs> 0 and 10. What is the probability of being between 0 and 10? Okay, you would do 34 plus 13.5, 47.5%. So you'd have these two sections right here, between 0 and 10. But the nice thing about just being introduced to the normal distribution is the fact that you're just going to focus on the standard deviations. And the more spread out something is, the bigger the standard deviation would be, the farther apart these two numbers will be. If they're closer to each other, these last two numbers will actually be a lot closer to each other. But no matter what the shape is for this bell-shaped curve, whether you have a big standard deviation or a smaller standard deviation, whether it's really squeezed together or more spread out, as long as it's a normal distribution, these percents hold every single time. The only thing that changes is the numbers on your axis, and that's it. Everything else is the same. Okay? What percent is above 10? What percent is above 10? How much? 50. Okay. Because you have to do the 34, the 13.5, the 2.35, and the 0.15. Now, we said 50% made us think median, which makes us think 50th percentile. Do you realize that this is the mean? and the median. Because I'm basing everything off the mean, but if it also represents the 50% mark, it's also the median. Does that always happen? No, definitely not. In a normal distribution where it's symmetric, that will happen. Okay, But in other cases, you might have a different shape for your data set. That's not going to happen. Now, what do I mean by different shapes? Something like this. Does that look like the same shape we've been drawing? No, this would be a skewed distribution. Those percents do not work on this picture. Or if it was skewed the other way, definitely not the same picture. Okay, we wouldn't use those percents. That's a completely different situation. Or if I had this and lots of heels, those percents don't work anymore. The only time they work is if I tell you it's a normal distribution, I tell you it's bell-shaped, and you instantly draw a picture like that. And you try to make it as symmetric and neat as you can, okay? And you want to leave yourself enough room to label these percents and also to label your numbers on your axis, okay? But once you have that picture, you can answer any question that someone gives you just by looking at the appropriate sections, okay? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Will those percentages always be the same for the bell shape? Yes, ma'am. These percentages stay the same for all bell-shaped curves like this. And I will use probably both terms just because we're introducing this and you haven't had a lot of in-depth. There's so much more we could talk about, but I'll say normal distribution. I'll say bell-shaped. Okay, so you're guaranteed. You will not come with any other percents. All right, let's pick back up with the normal distribution problem we were working on. We we're looking at systolic blood pressures. Uh, we're assuming they follow a normal distribution, which gives them this shape, bell-shaped. We have a mean of 108 and a standard deviation of 14, and I've explained how to get these numbers across the axis. Now what we want to do is to look on our curve and try to figure out the percentage 
from certain areas. Okay? So if we do that, remember what I said before. No matter what your distribution is, if you have that curve, it will work in every situation. So I'm going to quickly sketch my normal distribution curve again. I'm going to put 108 in the middle. I'm going to mark off three standard deviations above it and try to spread them out evenly. I got these a little too close, but spread them out evenly. And three standard deviations below it. We had 108 and we added 14 each time and came up with the following numbers. We subtracted 14 each time and came up with these numbers. And now I'm going to use this chart and I'm going to break things up into sections. I explained to you what numbers come from each section. So I want to just kind of summarize it and for any problem this will always work. So the next thing I want to do is just write down, well this was 34 percent and this was 34 percent. Then we had 13.5 percent on the two sides and then we had 2.35 percent. So you notice it keeps getting smaller and smaller and then the tail ends were 0.15 percent. Very tiny percentage of this happening, but it's still possible. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to answer the following questions. So I'll occasionally refer back to this as I do each question. So first of all, this one says about 68 percent of the blood pressures are between blank and blank. Well 68 percent is a common empirical rule number and 68 percent represents from one standard deviation to the next. So I'm looking at one below and one above. And what I basically have here is a 34 and a 34. So what I'll do is I'll say 34% plus 34%. That would be 68%. So that does equal 68. I know I'm on the right track and I just need to record the 94 and the 122. So 68% will be approximately between 94 and 122. Okay, moving on to the next one, 95%. Well, that should jump out at me very quickly. 95% would be two standard deviations above and also two below. So we're looking at 80 to 136. And so very quickly I can tell you what I expect. How often do I expect it? 95% of the time the systolic blood pressure will be between 80 and 136. It's those other smaller percentage times where we run into trouble. Okay, here's a question. I've worded it a little bit different. About blank percent of the blood pressures are between 66 and 150. Now 66 and 150 Notice they're both three standard deviations above and three standard deviations below. Well, that means I can go with my empirical rule number and I've already learned 99.7. So these three questions are very straightforward where they let me use the empirical rule and move one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below or two above and two below or three above and three below. It gets a little bit trickier when you try to change and don't just use standard deviations. So these three questions help you deal with moving it to a different position. So for example, 94 and 108. What is the percentage of blood pressures that are between 94 and 108? Well 94 and 108 is just this little section, but I already have it labeled as 34%. If I was drawing a picture of this, I might do a quick little curve, put 108 under the highest part, put 94 to the left. I happen to know that this area, this percentage represents 34 percent. So you can very quickly draw pictures to help describe what you're looking at. Okay, what about this one? What is the percentage of blood pressures that are between 80 and 122? Now 80 and 122, if I was to draw a picture, I put 108 in the middle. That's my average. 122 is my first standard deviation away. 80 is two standard deviations away. So I went 
one up and two down. So I have three little sections. <clears throat> this one is 13.5, this one is 34, and this one is 34. If I simply add those three numbers, each one of these are percents, then I'll end up with 81.5%. So you don't have to be restricted to just standard deviation numbers that fit the empirical rule. You're allowed to move around a little bit. The last one says what percentage of blood pressure is above 136? Okay, let's look at that again. Draw a quick little picture, put 108 in the middle, and I know that my picture had 122, 136, and I want above 136, and it also went out to 150. So I have these two sections from 136 to 150, and I also have 150 and above. So if I take these two sections, just these two, 2.35 and the 0.15, I end up with 2.5%. And so, like I said, you're not restricted to the empirical rule standard deviations. You're allowed to do a little bit more. Uh, you have a little more flexibility. You could even do things like uh, 110, 115, 123, but that would be a little bit more involved course, and, and we're not going to go quite that far. So your numbers will still fall in your standard deviations, but this is how you would deal with them. If you have any questions, please let me know.